Because just like it says in 2 Timothy 3.16, that God's word is God breed and is good. I'm, I'm not going to say it word for word, but it's good for reproof, for correction, for doctrine. And it's, we use it for evangelism to help people get saved. Okay, this is the word of God. It comes from the mouth of God. Now, I heard seen somebody on the internet talk about, well, uh, the Bible, they didn't get straight word for word for God like all these other religions. It's because all the other religions really didn't get from their God either because their God was false. They got it from either themselves through oral tradition or through a demon. And when we talk about oral tradition, that means they pass it down to down on generations, just like the Bible did and some things that were oral until it was written down. But it doesn't mean that it was like the telephone game where the words changed later. But what happened was later it was written down. For example, Genesis and part of Exodus was oral tradition. And then later it was written down. It was passed word for word, mouth for mouth. And the scribe probably was Joshua. And some of the other priests that there were writing notes, they put all the notes that Moses put together along with the Ten Commandments and all the other written laws that God told him to write. And they not only said it word by word, but those things were written down and passed down, but the words didn't change. They might have a little comma here and a, a little bit of diction missing here, but the words of meaning did not change the word because it's the word of God. It's the word of God. And if God said it, you better believe it. And that should settle it for you because God keeps his word. And as we're reading through the book of Jeremiah today, we will see that God keeps his word. Welcome, welcome, whoever that is. Say hi so that we know you're here. I see I have one comment there. Let's see if that's, I can see who it is. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank, thank you for coming, Christina. Thank you. And I'm going to put, I, I did put some words there, but I'm going to put the link back in there. If you are interested in getting the outline of the sermon, and I have some people that are asking for some notes that they can use for teaching and things like this, you can take this outline, listen to the sermon, and then redo it your style where you're at, either for a Sunday school class or for your own service. You have my permission to take my outline and preach it. People do it anyhow. I have, I know one preacher, in fact, that has two or three times, which I was really surprised because this guy has way more education than I have, took straight up the verses and the outline. And I sat in church and heard that person preach it or online use it, this exact same outline, which is okay. If it helps, do that. Okay, so if you need to do that, go on and do that. All right. But remember that the word of God is true. The word of God comes from God. It's not some fairy tale. It's not something that came from a demon. Like we have one religion that says an angel appeared to him. We have two religions, not one, two major. One's a, a, a cult of Christianity, and one is a major religion here in the world. And there might be a couple more that I don't know about, the, the Gnostics, which is another Christian cult. And there's some Indian groups that are that claim they had received a vision from Gabriel and thing, I think, I'm not sure, don't quote me on that, okay, that mixed their the, the, their, their religion with the Christian religion. They claim that either Gabriel and the Mormons say that uh, an angel by the name of Morani, I believe, came and appeared to them and gave them a new word, a new revelations. But let me tell you to think about this. Think about this. Both people were disillusioned by the church. Muhammad was disillusioned by the Christians and the Jews fighting. And instead of receiving the word of God and realize that man is not God and that man makes mistakes, you don't worship the pastor, you worship God. You don't worship the system, you worship God. You don't become a cult of personality, you become a follower of God. In fact, I just seen a video that remind me of an argument we had even in the convention I'm part of. There was an argument where we're going to make the Bible supreme over everything. And there was an argument over that because the problem is that the Bible is not God. It's important. It's the word of God. 
but we got we can't worship the book. We got to worship the creator who gave us the words. The book sometimes, well, I won't say manipulated, but you know, we could be legalistic. We could we could go make our own doctrines and stuff. We just worship the book. But if we're worshiping God, then everything is straight because you had a Holy Spirit that comes into you that reveals to you the truth. And when you're hearing the truth, you follow the truth. If you're not hearing the truth, you won't follow it. Okay? So don't get me wrong in saying that the Bible's flawed. No, no, no. Like I said, there's been some some little variations on like commas and sentences and stuff like that. But overall, word for word is the word of God. Now we have sometimes uh problems with interpreting from the Greek text and the the and and, and things like that. But Oh, as we research more, sometimes those things get corrected, but it doesn't change the word. It doesn't change the meaning. And the gospel is still the same. Jesus Christ died on the cross your sins. He rose again from the dead. The only way to receive salvation is by receiving his Holy Spirit inside your heart, by receiving Jesus in your heart and going to heaven. That's the only way to get salvation. And then we, after we receive the Holy Spirit, we are saved. We're going to heaven. We express what Christ has done for us symbolically by being baptized, being a witness to our friends and family, which we will be doing. I'm trying, I want to do it the fourth Sunday next month, or probably be the third Sunday, because I have an event going on in my family that's really important. Uh, my daughter's having a baby shower, so I may not be able to make it on the fourth Sunday. So we might move it to the third Sunday, but we will be having a baptismal service next month. And we're going to have it right here at the address. Let me put the address here. For you, if you guys like to come. In fact, uh, we start here at 4:30 in the afternoon. We got a little bit late start today, but we start at 4:30 in the afternoon. If you'd like to come and join us, come to this address right here. Okay, this is where we meet for worship at 4:30 in the afternoon. Okay, but the only way you can receive salvation is by receiving Jesus Christ in your heart, in your life, by surrendering your life to Him. That's the only way you see salvation. It's not really what we do for him, but that we receive for him because it's mercy and power. And it goes along with our verse. So those who are listening that are part of the Great Commission Evangelist Ministry and those that like to join us in this, our memory verse, we're given one more week because I didn't get a chance to get the material out, is John 1, 12. For as many as received, and I'm doing the King James Version on the booklet, I'm handing out has the NIV version. So it's a little bit different. I think it says, yet those that receive him or something like that, but I'm doing King James Version. For as many as receive him, to them he's given the right to become sons of God, even to those that believe in his name. So if you have received Jesus Christ, you are now a child of God. You are a son of God. Now, does it mean that you're equal to Jesus? No. It means that you're adopted by God. And that's expanded more in Romans chapter 15 and 16, which I talked about earlier on the video I put online. You are adopted by God. Like I have some, some children. I adopted them. And to be, you know, it's sort of weird. If I die, they have more rights than my children that I did not adopt. I have a few children that were not adopted. My adopted children have more right than them because they're not my natural children. I adopted them. Okay. So. That's what it's like when we become a child of God. Now we have the rights and privileges just at the same as people of Israel did because we have the Holy Spirit inside our hearts. We had a right to go to heaven. We had a right to call to God and get help from God and to be led by God as we're led by his Holy Spirit. But only because we surrendered to him and his Holy Spirit came in us. And we're going to talk more about this later today. But we're going to go to Jeremiah chapter 40, verse 1 to 4. And let's take some time to look at that verse. Jeremiah chapter 40. And we're going to be reading all the way up today to verse 6. Okay, And then we're going to finish the rest next week because that's a totally different story. The word came to Jeremiah from the Lord after Never Zardin, commander of the Pearl Guard, had released him at Ramah. He found... Jeremiah bound the chains along with all the captives from Israel and Judah who had been carried into exile to Babylon. 
And when the commander of the guard found Jeremiah, he said to him, the Lord your God decreed this disaster for this place. And now the Lord has brought it about. He has done to you as he said he would. So we're going to stop right there. So verse 1 and 2, I mean 1 through 4, I believe I've already read it. I'll let me read verse 3. It says, and now the Lord has brought it about, and he has done as he said he would. All happened because you people sinned against the Lord and did not obey him. You could call this shackled. Shackled. And we're going to talk about how God releases the shackles in our lives. So if we had to put three points, first, we are shackled. Then we are set free. And then we are set right. First, you are shackled. Then you're set free. And then you're set right. Shackled, set free, and set right. Can you say that? Say shackled. Let me hear you guys out in the internet there. Say set free. Let me hear you say that. And then set right. Set right. So we're just going to keep talking about that, okay? And I see we're having some signal issues. I don't know how to deal with that. I think it's the building. This building has some signal issues. Uh, so we're just going to have to deal with it, okay? And here, in verse 1, it says that they found Jeremiah and he was bound in chains. And the word bound means to be shackled. They had a rope coming from his feet, tying his feet. It was like this, just like you see the chain gangs. They walk with a rope and feet, but they they could barely walk. But he was tightly shackled because what happened that Babylon took over the earth. They, they took all the surviving people that made them prisoners, and they put them in a chain and shackles, just like you see a slave line going through, and took them out to a different area, to the city of Rama, and decided what was going to happen to them. They already the the Babylon came already had orders for them. And remember what happened before then. Jerusalem was decimated. Babylon came and put a siege around the place, cut them off, cut up food, cut off uh, access to water and things like that. And people were dying. Cannibalism happened. And there was a lot of death and destruction. And then they once they're weakened, the Babylon army came and freed them. So that's what happened. And then those that survived were sent out. They were taken out of Jerusalem. And also, let me add a little more to there. The walls were torn down. The, the temple was torn down. They took out the gold. They took out all the precious metals and everything out of the temple. The temple was desecrated. So it was a great insult to the people. And God himself Later, we find out in Daniel was upset about that as well. But he was shackled. He was chained. He was in a situation where he was not in control. And the people of Israel also were shackled and chained along with him. That came along with them. And they had already took the smart people out. They took all the, the people that we call essential workers out. Remember that term, essential workers? You're an essential worker because you, you are your, your job's important to keeping things running during the pandemic. When we had this pandemic, we had a term called essential workers. All the essential workers were taken out. The people that they thought matter. All the teachers were gone. All the engineers were gone. All the nurses and medical people were gone. All the priests and all the wise men of wisdom were gone and taken to Babylon and Jeremiah was lucky that he wasn't, not lucky, but God told him that he was not going to be taken to Babylon. And it did not happen. God kept his word. And God kept his word to Israel. He said this was going to happen, and they didn't listen, and they were decimated. And people, God is telling you to follow his word. Sometimes we have problems in life, and I'm going to talk about the way it is here in America. Okay, I know another uh, countries it might be a little bit different because in other countries you're born maybe in poverty and it's very difficult to get out and your parents can't do anything to get out. but here in America we in, this is a land of opportunity and if you want to get out of poverty you can if you want to get 
a good job. You can. Education is free. We have advantages here that nobody else has. Uh, and I, I, I get on the kids all the time because I have kids that parents come from Mexico and from Asia and other places. And they're working hard, scrubbing floors, driving trucks, working in the warehouse and things like that. And, and for other countries too, not just Mexico, but Central America, Venezuela. I met some kids where parents came from Afghanistan and I met some Africans and so forth. I met it pretty much from all parts of life, even people that came from Muslim countries, okay? I had all those students in there that parents had to either pay a lot of money, and I know they had to pay a lot of money because when I was at Cal Baptist, I had a friend from Singapore, his dad, uh, well, actually his uncle helped him put down a bond to make sure that he could come to America so he could go to school to guarantee he was going to go back and serve in the military. I know the same thing's done in other countries so they could come here and go to school and also become a citizen uh, to get your green card. You got to have a certain job. You got to meet a certain regulation. There are certain things that have to be paid for. And even to get here, they have to pay a lot of money. I helped the guy. This was years ago when I was young. I wouldn't be doing this now. So don't be calling me, asking me to do this. I signed, uh, I guess, a slight sponsor. I didn't realize I was sponsoring at the time. I just signed a note for him. I had a friend, my roommate was from China, and he came here on a student visa. He was poor in China. He was not one of the rich ones in China, and he needed to get a job. He was trying to stay here so he could work and better himself and probably get some money back home, eventually get his family back here too, some of his other family. I signed, I signed a form so to, give him, to, to vouch for him to say that he was a good guy so he could go get his green card and go to work. Okay, but he had to pay a lot of money to come to the United States. And those that didn't have to pay a lot of money that were refugees, they had to go through, I have a friend, and I don't know if he's listening or not, but they had a, he had a, at 12 years old, had to carry a gun to go through the jungles and things to get where they are and, and, and to be able to, to be here in America. So that, the, and, and they were in a refugee camp for a long time. And some people died. They thought, uh, he told me a story that they, when he was young, he thought there was a monster in the river because something in the river was, was killing the, the children that would get in there, maybe an undertow or something like that. But uh, they went through all that and had to do certain things so to make sure, and he was the only story, stories of many people talking about uh, leaving from Cambodia, from Laos, and from Vietnam, coming here to come to America. And these parents are working hard to help these kids out. And all they have to do is get an education, have a good attitude, and work hard. But you'd be surprised how many kids, the parents I know told them to go to school and listen to get a good and get good get grades. And I know they told them to stay away from drugs, alcohol, and gays because they ran away from that coming from places like El Salvador and Venezuela and other places. The same thing in Vietnam. They had those things there. They, they didn't want to get involved in there and so forth. The same thing in Cambodia. They didn't want to get there, but some of these kids, they didn't listen to their parents. And guess what? They, they, they sometimes don't graduate. Some of the girls get a situation where they're pregnant early, and they don't get their education, and now they're back in poverty where they could have gotten out of poverty, got a good job, had a good reference from their family, and not be in poverty. Okay? And... And I'm not just talking about for foreigners. I'm talking about here in America for anybody, students. doesn't matter if you're black, white, Mexican, or whatever, because I've seen it all, okay? If you do what you're supposed to be doing in the school and listen to your teachers and listen to your parents, just like the Bible says, you could get ahead. You learn those skills so you could get a job. You learn how to be on time for school. You learn how to have be a good citizen in school and not have any disciplinary records. So when you go apply for that job, and they call and say, what type, how's Johnny in school? They oh, he's a good student. Oh, he's a hard worker. Oh, I want that guy to come work with me. And you might get a little McDonald's job and get some work experience. Maybe take a couple classes in high school at the city college or something like that. Or maybe get good grades so you can get scholarships to go to a four-year university, even though you didn't have a lot of money because you uh, called for, for Cal Grant or Pell Grant. And now you can get ahead. And those that listen, they get ahead. It's just like Jeremiah here. He listened to the word of God. 
and God protected him because he listened. Those that don't receive tragedy. We see in the previous chapter, the king got killed because he did not turn himself over to Babylonians like Jeremiah told him to. But still, sometimes in life we feel we're chained up. Because Jeremiah's like, well, I did what God sent me to do. I'm not dead. Thank God I'm not dead. But now I'm chained up and humiliated. And sometimes we still, even as Christians, feel chained up and humiliated. Where am I going to get money to pay for my bills? How am I going to help my kids with my education? How am I going to get through this marriage? I don't seem to be able to get along with my wife. Or my kids are driving me crazy. How am I going to be able to get through parenting these kids without killing them? How am I going to do it? I'm in this new marriage. How am I going to keep this marriage together? And you feel chained up. You feel hemmed up. You might be in a job that you might feel is a dead-end job. You all, every time you try to get ahead, you get, keep hitting your head against the wall and nothing changes. You try to get that promotion, but the promotion doesn't come and you feel chained up. You feel tied up. You feel chained up. And you're praying every day and you're reading your Bible every day. You're trying to treat people right every day. You're trying to do the things you're supposed to be doing as a Christian, but just don't say that you're getting headwind. What do you do when it's like that? You do what Jeremiah did. You stay obedient and you trust God. Jeremiah knew that when he talked to the king in the last chapter, he might die. Being a Christian, we need to be prepared for even death. Not that you go out and commit suicide. Not that you go wrap yourself with a whole bunch of uh, dynamite and go and blow people up and things like that. No, we're not talking about stuff like that. That's not the way of God. Okay? You don't do things to destroy yourself, to hurt yourself. That goes way to, away from the way of God. He wants us to have a good, meaningful life. That is not a good, meaningful life. That's not the way of God. So don't get it twisted. Okay? But you need to stand up for God, even means your death, even means your job. It means sometimes mean to give up your family. Not that you look to get divorced. You try to keep your family together. You try to listen to you, the wives try to be a good wife. The husband tries to be a good husband. The children try to be a good child. But in some cases, here in America, if you're atheist in an atheist family, you become a Christian, sometimes you get kicked out of your house. I talked to missionaries years ago, talked about that if you live in a Muslim country and you become a Christian, the Christians have to be prepared to take you into their house because they can't go home. Because they left their faith. Sometimes that's what it means to be a Christian. And you have to stay in. The Bible has a term in the New Testament called occupy. You have to occupy and keep yourself, stand your ground, and follow God. It is a spiritual battle. There's a lot of great things that happen when you become a Christian. But we got to remember, we have dedicated ourselves to God. We dedicate ourselves to be a follower of God, and we need to follow him whether the chains are on or not. But most times, God will come through for your rescue. In fact, I can tell you 99.9% .9 of the time, but this doesn't happen all the time. And it doesn't always happen the way we want. Like us that want to try to take our bills. I don't want to go to my mother-in-law, but my mother-in-law is uh, holding this money. I, I better take it and pay my bills. But that's not the way I want to do it. I got to take this job at the warehouse versus working in the sales place where it's air conditioned or not. I have to go out and dig ditches or mow lawns or clean cars or work. Like I had one time I had to work, work in a place where I had to cover myself up and down. I'm an asthmatic. And we work with a thing called muffle that they use for, as an interior insulation for an x-ray machine. And I had to take a shower every day before I did touch anything and, and put my clothes in a separate area so that I make sure that contamination did not get into my house and into the clothes of my family. 
I would rather have the job where they're over there with the electronic places where they didn't get dirty and they just maybe get a little bit sweaty because it gets hot in the warehouse. That would have been better for me. But that's not what happened. But God will come and help you out. He will rescue you. I want to ask a question out there. How has God helped you in hard times? Type, write it down. How has God helped you in hard times? Where you feel chained, you feel stuck. How did God help you in hard times? Because he will. And I'm going a little bit long today, but I just want to let you know, even though you feel chained, even though you feel like you can't move, even though you feel like your back is against the wall, you need to still trust in God like Jeremiah did. Because what happened? At the end, God had Jeremiah's back. And in verse 3, the people that suffered from sin got what they had coming to. But in verse 4, let's read that. But today I am freeing you from your chains and your wrists. Come to me in Babylon if you like, and I will look after you. But if you do not want to come, look, the whole country lies before you. Go wherever you please. And then he turned to Jeremiah and said, added, go back to Gedaliah, son of Achim, the son of Shaphan, who the king of Babylon has appointed over the towns in Judah, and live with him among the people and go anywhere else you please. So he says, we have a place where we can live protected where nothing's going to happen to you because we know about you, Jeremiah. You can go live with them and they will protect you and they'll make sure you're safe from your enemies that might still be alive. I don't know how many times I had where people had it out for me, but God protected me. I was in church, and we're renting the church. And the person that was in charge of the church felt that we were competing against each other, which we weren't. I just said some words about to my members about we have to do everything to let people know we're here in this area because we're, we're tiny. And on the street in about two or three city blocks, there were 11 churches. And I just stress, we got to go out and put flyers everywhere and let people know where we are, do our best, let people know we're here, or we're just not going to get anywhere. And he took it as competition. Okay. Because these other churches have money. They could get they could get their newspaper out. And the best we could do sometimes, we can't do it every month, is use a penny saver. So we we I would burn out our printer making copies. I still do that today. Burn out a printer. Every two years I had to buy a new printer because the printer was cheaper to make copies for flyers. And this person not only was uh, threatened to evict me that time, and we weren't paying a lot of money. We were trying to be graceful, I mean, you know, to work with him because he was working with us. But on top of that, he uh, he was trying to get the little tiny people we had. We were not a very big church. I think we had maybe two or three families coming, maybe not even that, to get them to leave and go there with him. As you know, we're trying to build up, and we're paying him rent to use the place. And then on top of that, we have worship services, and those worship to kind of interrupt our services. And... It came to the time towards the end of the year that we were there. I was given to say, well, you know, we're going to raise the rent after we've been dealing with all this stuff. You can either stay and pay the upper rent and go. I'll give you 30 days to make a decision. Of course, we said no, which means that we had to go and find another place. We had nowhere else to go. Thought about going back to my house, but at that time, I was in a small apartment far away. The other family we were working with. Living in the town next door, two towns next away. Uh, uh, we had somebody that let us use their place, but it wasn't conducive for Bible study. So we started meeting inside a motel. Uh, but we could only meet there once a month. And then finally, God opened the door. Think about ask, it shall be given to you, seek, and you shall find. Knock the door, we open it. That, that, that verse, Matthew 7 7, came to me, and he opened the door where one of my pastor's friends allowed us to go there with the price we could afford and meet there. We stayed there for quite a long time until I took a pastor on Barstow. Okay, God will work with you and rescue, but you got to trust him. You got to be faithful. You got to keep going. And even though it seems like you're against the wall, even though it seems like you might be banging your head against the wall, 
you still got to trust in God and God will help you and God will vindicate you and provide for you. Now, that's my story. What's your story? Because I know I'm not the only one that's experienced this. Share your story so other people know. God will rescue you. God will rescue you. And let me just talk about this. We were bound in sin. And because of sin, we were destined to go to hell. But because of God's love towards us, for those that want to be set free, he provided for us to be set free. John 3, 16 says, For God so the world that gives one begotten Son, that whoso believes shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And then it says in John 1, 12, our memory verse, For as many as received him, he's going to write to become the sons of God into those that believe in his name. And Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14 says that those that receive Jesus, they receive the Holy Spirit in their life, and the Holy Spirit becomes a deposit of our salvation until Christ comes and provides everything he promises. So when you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit comes to you. He doesn't leave until you get everything you're supposed to get, if you truly receive Jesus Christ. Now, let me say that. If you truly receive Jesus Christ in your heart. Some people pray a prayer. They have emotional spirits. They might get emotional and even say some words, but it's not real. It's not from God. But when you have a true experience of Christ, you're going to feel the Holy Spirit there. Not necessarily a big hip hurrah. Some people do, some people don't. But they sense his presence. They sense God working. They sense his change. And they know they're saved. And they can see God working in their life. Either answer a prayer, either they, they lost the need to do drugs and alcohol, or whatever case it may be. And God starts working with them. And as they read the Bible and go to church and have fellowship and be involved in ministry and do all the things you're supposed to be doing and worship and all those things, God starts working in them and making the change. But the Holy Spirit becomes a deposit for everything that's promised to them. Then later, it says in the First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 and 18, that Jesus Christ is going to come back and raise us from the dead if we're dead, and those lives will be transformed. We call that the rapture. He's going to come bring us back. And Revelation chapter 22, it says, those that did not receive Christ is going to be facing the white throne judgment. That means they had every, this will be time, I just thought my son, he's going, what's going to happen when Jesus Christ comes back? So it's going to be a great war. There's going to be a lot of death because people are going to rebel against God. You know, he's right there in front of them because for some reason they thought they could overthrow Jesus. And Jesus is going to set his place here on earth in Israel. And he will reign for a thousand years. So even after he comes back, there's a thousand years for those alive to get this so straight with Christ. Some still will not believe, even though he's right there in their face. And there's going to be a great war. Everything's over. And then the white throne judgment. The question is, which side are you going to be on? Are you going to receive Jesus Christ, your personal Lord and Savior, and receive him? Or are you going to go to heaven, where you had the Holy Spirit in you? And after all this stuff is over, are you going to live forever with Christ? Or are you going to be on the other side, where you reject Jesus Christ, where you go live your life the way you want to, live with your values the way you want to, and not have Jesus, and have a world of pain because you're destined yourself to go to hell? Because... Right now when you die, you go to what we call Sheol, to hell, which is pain and suffering, a temporary place, pain and suffering. But at the end, you're going to the lake of fire. The only way you know you're not going is you have Jesus Christ inside your heart and life. That's the only way. You wouldn't ask, well, how can I do that? It's very simple. You say these words, and you have to mean it in your heart. Lord Jesus, I need you. Repeat that if you want to receive Jesus. I believe that you died across my sins. I believe that you rose again from the dead. Please forgive me for my sins. Please come to my heart and be my Lord and Savior. And today I surrender myself to you. If you say that and mean it, that means Christ will send the Spirit to you. And that means now you're born again, and you're be able to go to heaven. It's not just the words you got to mean it, and Christ will send the Spirit to you. Let's take some time to pray. Oh God, I just want to thank you for letting us be here today. I just praise your holy name. 
I pray just touch every single person today and that you will just help those that don't know you know this personal Lord and say that they'll pray that prayer and receive you and say it and mean it and surrender lives to you. I pray that we as Christians will stay faithful to you, knowing that you'll be with us, protect us, just like you did Jeremiah. And if that comes, we don't have to worry about that because we know we're living forever with you in heaven and also in the new heaven and new earth. As Richard mentioned in Revelation chapter 22. And I just praise you. I pray to be with those that are all over the world. Those are doing house churches. Those are, are, are working with those that are working with orphans and the poor and the needy. Those here in America that are out church planning and going out talking to their friends and family and their neighbors and people like me that go out and do door knocking and, and things, those that are reaching the, the homeless and, and feeding, all the ministries that are doing that, that are, are, are within our ministry circle, within, you know, we're Southern Baptists, but even those that are non-Southern Baptists, those that are, in, are connected with us here on the web and so forth. I pray you just put your spirit around them all, God. And those that might hear this word, that those sins your spirit touch them, God, even as you're listening to the replay. And God, those that I've spoken to online this week and those that, 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 that I haven't had a chance to, but those that I pray for, that you will answer their prayers. Those that need help, we have families with some women, more than one woman that's pregnant that I spoke to this week. Be with their babies and let it come out healthy. Let those babies come out healthy. Help to get the resources they need to feed. Those that are ministers, working as evangelists that they balance the time with the family and with the community for the men and the women that they'll balance their time so that they, they will be healthy to take care of their family, take care of themselves and do your work, God. And help me, God, to do the same thing because I have difficulty with that myself, God. God, I pray that you will bring protection for those, especially the pictures I see. And I don't know how recent those pictures were. They might be old. They might have been reason. I've seen them over and over again. I know it happens not just in Pakistan. I know it happens in Africa. I know it happens in other parts of the Middle East and also in India and other parts of the country where, I mean the world, where people are torn out of the buildings, their property taken because they decide to serve and follow you. But they still stay strong and they still raise your banner to cross. They still speak out for you. And these young men and women are taking their a risk, putting their lives on the line, speaking out for you, I, especially the ones that I've had the chance and the pleasure to talk to. I pray that you will put a protection around all, all the ones I'm thinking of now and the ones I can't remember. I pray that you put a protection around them, God. I pray that you'll do that, put a hedge of protection around them. For those that have professional physicians that are still taking a risk because even though they have money and title, they can be taken away because of their faith. And I pray that you will put a protection around them too, God. And God, also I pray that those that are in need, that they will learn the term bloom where you're planted. And God, I pray that you raise them on a grassroots level, even though be like the Philippians, not having much, but gathering it together to do the ministry that needs to be done and how the other churches or friends gather along with them as people become saved and bring resources to help build their ministries. And I pray that you do the same thing here with Great Commission Evangelists and Ministry. And I just praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys. You have a good day.